But one thing I want you to be sure that I included in your exam is a question that involved the Newton's third law in some way. And um, so this question doesn't really involve Newton's third law, not directly in a very recognizable way, but a situation that you have seen, which does involve Newton's third law is a setup like this one. Uh, I guess I'm skipping this. Uh, set up like this one, where you have multiple blocks connected by some string. Then uh, this is where you do have um, something that's uh, similar to action reaction force pairs, and you have to have a very clear way of thinking about how the, those two different, uh, how those blocks interact. Uh, the nickname I like to give to give to Newton's third law is the law of interaction. It's the law that uh, really describes how uh, two or more objects interact with each other. So that um, really the thing that you have to distinguish here is that the force that I'm applying, it applies only to the rightmost block. It only applies to M3 then uh, as a matter of having complete mechanical theory of universe, what you have to figure out is how does M2 and M1 move? And on the flip side, how does having M1 and M2 affect the motion of M3? And the way we do that is through Newton's third law. And a setup like this can illustrate that consideration fairly well. So let me just do that. I think I can do that in 10 minutes or so if I'm just doing part A. Um, so if there's no objection or question, let me at least do part A and then uh, I'll see if I want to do more than that. <laughs> so I have three objects. That means I need to draw three free bodies or th three free body diagrams. Let me call this M1, M2, and M3. And I think in the homework question you had, you had these uh, blocks dealing with some friction. But for this question at least, I'm not saying for your exam whether it'll be one or the other. For this question, it says neglect any friction, so I'll neglect the friction. And that also means I'm just gonna ignore uh, vertical forces because the normal force really only becomes interesting when you have friction to deal with, and I don't here, so. So I'm only going to draw horizontal forces that will make you go a little bit quicker. Um, so let me start by just drawing all the forces. I like to, um, so even without gravity, I like to draw forces that I know I have to draw. So let me start out with F3 on M3 here, not F3, F on M3 here. And I just want to emphasize, this is the only place where I draw F. The apply the force F, it acts on M3. It doesn't act on any other bodies directly. And free body diagram only indicates forces that are directly acting on. So that's it. That's the only place where I'm going to draw F. Now, as I look at this uh, picture, think about this setup, I ask myself the same question I always ask. Have I drawn all the forces? Then as I look at this string, I realize, oh, I need the tension force coming from this string. So let me draw the tension force there. Since it's a string too, let me call that T2. So there's T2. Then, the, um, then I ask myself this question, have I drawn all the forces? As far as M3 goes, that seems like it. I don't see any other force that should be there. So I'm done with all the forces on M3. And I guess you can go a couple different ways. You can just look at M2 and M1 and try to think about what forces should be there. That's probably the way most people will go. So let me do it the other way. I'll do it uh, through the Newton's third law check. Since this uh, situation especially has three objects, it's uh, 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 especially important that you do this check and make sure all the, for, all the internal forces have a reaction force labeled. So this apply the force F, that's external force, I don't need a reaction force to that. So for this force T2 from string two, you think about the reaction force to this T2. 
So I guess technically the reaction force is on the string, but I'm not drawing diagram of the string. And really all that the string is doing is kind of allowing these two sides to interact with each other. So the reaction force is on this side here. It's on M2. So I should have a force on M2 that's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So now I have a force on M2, which is going to cause M2 to accelerate. Then I once again, ask myself the question, have I drawn all the forces? Then I hope you see that you have this string here too. Uh, so there should be T1 here. Then going through the Newton's third law check again, this kind of check and constantly asking yourself, have I done everything? It's an iterative thing. You, uh, you know, keep doing it until the answer is no. You have remembered everything. Everything is perfect. Nothing needs to change. <laughs> until you get that answer, you keep doing that check. Um, so doing that check, you get one more thing, T1, uh, that's acting on mass M1. And you still do that check, you know, have I drawn all the forces? And as you do that check with M1, M2, M3, now you should get the answer that says, oh, you've drawn all the forces that are in the horizontal direction. Um, yeah, so that's the free body diagram. And uh, I guess that uh, sort of, unless there are questions or requests, I think that's where I'll stop. Um, in part to be really the main thing that you have to remember is uh, make sure you remember that all blocks accelerate together. And that um, that fixes what the tensions T1 and T2 have to be so that all blocks accelerate together. And uh, yeah, I think part B is fairly easy to do here. Um, and parts, yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, I don't want people to focus on minutiae. It's more about, do you understand how to set it up and how to analyze it so that I can give you infinite uh, different varieties. I think I've given a version of this question where things are hanging vertically and you've had in your homework where there were friction. So, but uh, once you remember to, once you know all the steps you need to go through, then uh, you can adapt to, to any changes that I might throw at you. So, so uh, we'll just uh, work this question through. We're going to make use of this free body diagram. And it's uh, the most challenging thing about this question is really the number of objects to handle. So you have three objects, even with one dimension, that means you have three equations <laughs> that you have to work through. So let me just uh, label my equations one, two, and three after the objects that we have and just to uh, write them out. Um, here, I'm going to remember to do it the way we are doing now, which is, um, uh, I, so, so just standard study steps. We drew a free body diagram. Uh, for the axis, the prop, uh, the convenient axis is the one that goes along the direction of expected acceleration. So my positive x-axis is going to be to the right for all my objects. And y-axis, I don't really need to worry because there are no interesting forces there to worry about. So uh, that's step number two. Step number three, break down forces into components. Don't need to, it's one dimensional. Step number four, we are writing down Newton's second law equations and I'm gonna be careful to write down this version. The acceleration is the net force divided by mass. Uh, you know, it's a mathematical equivalent to F equals MA. The di difference here is that this highlights more clearly the cause and effect. The net force is what causes acceleration, not the other way around. So, and uh, as I'm writing, one thing that's uh, uh, important is that all blocks accelerate together. So there is going to be one value of acceleration that applies to all the blocks that makes the problem workable. So the acceleration for block M is going to be given by the net force just the tension one divided by its mass, M1. That's the first equation. Acceleration for the second block is going to be given by the net force, T2 minus T1. I'm putting the directions into the signs, the T1 being leftward, that's reflected in this minus sign, divided by M2. Remember, it's always the mass of the object whose equation you're writing that 
this message is for. Equation number three for object three, acceleration, same acceleration is equal to the net force, apply the force, minus, and it's just the T2. I don't have to worry about T1. T1 has been taken care of at this step. That's really why we draw free body diagram so that we can focus on one object at a time. We don't get confused about which force applies on what. So I have these three equations. Let's uh, make sure we have um, uh, not too many unknowns. So it says uh, tension follow give your answer in terms of uh, now. So okay, we are given the applied force. Uh, we are at, being asked for tensions. Okay, so the tensions T1 and T2 are both unknowns, I guess. Uh, oh, and we don't know acceleration. Yeah, so. And I think all other quantities are known. Masses are known, force is known. Yeah. So this will be the strategy then. Our goal is to eliminate acceleration from all our equations. And I think the simplest thing to do is our equation one is the simplest of three equations. So I'm just going to use this to eliminate A from my other two equations. So when you do that, you end up with um, T1 over M1 is equal to, that's the left-hand side here, the right-hand side, T2 minus T1 over M2, and then uh, plug that in here as well, T1 over M1 is equal to F minus T2 over M3. And after that, I'm done with this equation. I do have to be careful not to reuse it because the name of the game here is dealing with an independent system of equations. If I reuse this, there's a danger that I might make my system of equations dependent <laughs> and solution gets complicated. So once I'm here, then uh, solving for T1 or T2, I don't think there's a real advantage in doing one first versus the other. They're both complicated. Um, just staring at this for a bit. I think eliminating T2 is easier just because it, it occurs in fewer spaces. And, and yeah, let me do it that way. And let me model the approach that I recommend for everyone. So when you look at equations like this, you can do something like a linear combination. Okay. It works fine. It saves some steps. The problem with the linear combination is uh, sometimes it takes some practice to see what will work. So I'm going to show you what's more uh, closer to brute force. I'm just doing the kind of mechanical uh, <laughs> zero thinking thing, <laughs> which is that I'm going to take this equation. I'm going to solve it for T2. Once I've done that, I can substitute in here and eliminate T2 from my system of equations. So let me just solve this for T2. So uh, I guess I need to multiply both sides by M3. And then I have to move T2 over, move everything else over. Yeah, so let me do one step at a time. Multiply both sides by M3. So I have M3 over M1 for left-hand side times T1. Right-hand side will be F minus T2. And I'm imagining moving T2 over and moving this thing over. Once I've done that, I have T2 is equal to F minus M3 over M1 T1. Okay, that's my expression for T2. And that's my tool for plugging into this place for T2 and just eliminating T2 from my system of equations. And I will want to save this part to come back to later so that I can actually express T2 in terms of uh, my other things. So doing the substitution, I have T1 over M1 is equal to all of that F minus M3 over M1 T1 didn't forget any minus sign, <laughs> minus T1 over M2. All right, let me collect all the like terms of T1 on the left-hand side. Yeah. So collecting all the like terms, I have T1. The first term is this, 1 over M1. And I imagine distributing this M2 through and then moving them over. When I do that, this term becomes plus m3 over m1 times m2. And when I do that with that term, it becomes plus 1 over m2. I think that's everything. Is equal to the thing that's remaining right-hand side, f over m2. 
and yeah, and at this step, if you want to double check your algebra and make sure you didn't make algebra mistake, this is the thing to do. You can check for dimensional consistency here. These three terms are being added, which means they should have same units. If they don't, then you can't add them together. So this says unit of inverse kilogram, and make sure your other two terms also have unit of inverse kilogram. If they don't, you might have forgotten something and so on. So uh, let me just write down an expression for T1. So this is not fully simplified, but this is the kind of expression where if you are given the numbers, you can just plug in the numbers. T1 is equal to F over M2 divided by 1 over M1 plus M3 over M1 times M2 plus 1 over M2. And there are ways to beautify this expression. I think you can cancel out M2. Oh, wait, you can't. Um, there are ways to beautify this expression, but let me just leave it here. This is a perfectly serviceable expression in that um, once you are given the numerical values of force and the three masses, then you can just plug them in, get a numerical value for T1. And once you have that, then you can plug it in here to get a numerical value for T2. And uh, if that's where you want to leave algebra, in situations like this, that's fine. There isn't really a big payoff from simplification anyway. Uh, I think I got two more parts. <laughs> yeah. Suppose that the mass of the second block is doubled. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think I do have time to answer. So let me just uh, bring these two over. And that question actually might go to the oops, point of um, <laughs> why you should simplify so that you can answer certain questions. But these were our expressions for tensions. So it's saying, imagine um, doubling the mass of the second block. Okay, so wherever I see M2, I am going to say 2M2. And let's see what happens. So I don't see any M2 here, so I'm going to leave this alone. Now I do see M2 here, so let me make this 2M2. And I see M2 here, make this 2M2, 2M2. Okay, so I think uh, that's enough for me to think through. So what this will, let me, all these nested fractions are annoying me. So let me do F over 2M2 times 1 over, um, 1 over M1 plus M3 over M1 times M2, 2, plus 1 over 2, M2. So you can actually, the, I guess, way to think about is distribute this 2 in. Then what happens is that you have this factor of 2 here, and these other 2s cancel. So the effect of changing M2 into 2M2 is actually this one. All other terms remain the same. One of the positive terms in the denominator increases. So the overall effect of that on T1 is that T1 will actually decrease. Okay, T1 decreases, and I think I can track that through here. If T1 here decreases, then T2 will increase. That's interesting. Uh, T1 decreases, T2 increases when the middle block has greater mass. And I think once you have that answer, then it becomes maybe easier to conceptually explain why that's correct answer. You know, imagine going back to here. You are pulling with the, the same amount of force, and you imagine this mass getting heavier. Then I think it makes sense that this tension, T2, will increase because it's uh, having to pull a heavier mass. Um, the harder part might be explaining why should the T1 decrease? I mean, you know, it's, uh, M1 didn't change. And the kind of the thing that helps is, like, if you work out acceleration, you should find that with the increased uh, increase the mass, overall mass, the, and the same force, acceleration will be less. So this tension force here, it's providing less acceleration for M1. So that's why it would go down. And all of that, you know, that kind of intuitive conceptual thing, um, it should agree with the mathematical results you drive.